Hey, it's Jay. This is part two of my conversation with Keith Frankish, all about illusionism and the theory of mind. Obviously, if you haven't listened to part one, you might want to do that, or else you risk being a bit confused here, but I'll recap. In part one, Frankish and I laid out what illusionism is. I kept referring to illusionism as a kind of stance rather than a full scientific theory. I'm not sure if there's really a difference there or not. Um, In part two, Frankish continues to call it a frame or stance or even language, which aims to concentrate us on the things that need explaining and prevents us from focusing on the impossible questions which don't need to be explained. In this part, he continues to do a fantastic job at threading that needle. We keep digging in deeper here, but now shift to more of the implications of the illusionist's stance. Some moral, some philosophical, and otherwise political fallout that would happen if more of us onboarded this kind of attitude. We do this by getting into that possibly separate question of what is morally valuable? Is it physical complexity in itself that is valuable? Or is it values or characteristics or behaviors of even simple things that's valuable? But we try to erase the illusion that the thing that provides the moral value is the ghost in the machine, the question of another creature somehow appearing to have qualia, but lacking it, this is Chalmers' philosophical zombie, is not the right question and will hopelessly distract us from sense-making and moral progress. I want to take a quick moment to bring up another example of how I understand Frankish to be using the word illusion here as to try to minimize lingering confusion. This is just as much for myself as for the listener as I am still trying to really get a hold of it. So let me try. Think of time. And in particular, think of the feeling that time is passing. Take a moment and just feel it. Just feel a bit of time passing. Do you feel it? Did you find it? When you went to look for it, did you sense a kind of private feeling of movement or a shift somehow? For me, trying to find the feeling of time passing and always in this one direction is a bit tricky. It pops in and out almost like one of those magic eye illustrations that you could see if you stared at a page long enough. But what is time passing? Or the feeling of time passing? Or more precisely, what aspect of time passing needs to be explained until we have taken the concept as far as it could go? What if I pause the entire universe somehow? Every piece of it is defined by its components of forces, but it's completely frozen, physically. Does time passing exist in a paused universe? It appears that it doesn't. If I then move all the physical pieces of that paused universe just a tiny bit and now have a second state of that universe, does time passing exist in the new one alone? Well, no, it appears not. But this thing called time seems to have now found a place in the whole experiment as a measure of a change between the two universes. And if the feeling of time passing must be experienced by a mind, the state of mind in the second universe must recall the state of the universe just a moment ago to experience the feeling of time passing. So do I need to explain this feeling of time passing any more than this? Can I simply say that it is an illusion created by the recipe of the physical universes moving, which I just laid out? What is the illusion of time passing? So this is the tricky part. If you could imagine pausing the universe completely and somehow look at your watch and it's still ticking away, you could somehow be moving between a set of paused universes. That's the illusion part. 
that the feeling itself in your experience of time passing in this private sort of soul eternal way is somehow separate from the physical universe's movements rather than an illusory effect of the physical universe itself that you and your mind are all pieces of that same universe and when you pause it you must also be pausing yourself mind and illusions of time passing included the feeling of time passing is an illusion a rather incredible one at that and there's much explaining left to do about how the illusion is created but the answers to those questions will ultimately be found in physics and won't penetrate the impossible mysteries of why there is a universe in the first place which is a trap which has diverted some of the best thinkers the magician of the universe is incredibly good and people are trying to explain magic rather than find all the fishing wires magnets and trap doors what i really loved about the second half of my conversation with keith frankish is some of our spitballing at the end of the role of philosophy in society and the need to export these kinds of conversations to a general public which is hungry and in desperate need of better tools to explore philosophically important subjects i share a, a somewhat dismaying experience from a trip to iceland and a session with a buddhist monk speaking on the topic of reincarnation to illustrate this point so here is part 2 of my conversation and the final part with keith frankish on the topic of illusionism and mind and consciousness so enjoy i think that the main motivation for my view of consciousness is a a desire for explanation mm. um, i i i i take it as a presumption that think that every that things are explicable no they may not be but you know i i i i work on the assumption that they're explicable taking consciousness as fundamental is kind of declaring that it's not explicable it's fundamental it's part you've just got to accept it's part of reality and that's it it's there end of the story okay that could be true but it's a, to me that's disappointing it means it's not explicable mm. and uh, people have this <laughs> this strange to me strange reaction that well it's it's just physical then it's not kind of it's not so sp- special i think no physical in the sense of what's mapped by the physical sciences is a wonderful realm of uh, astonishing uh, richness and uh, and variety and uh, and intelligibility i don't find anything that anything's degraded by by being merely physical do you know what's degraded though by i'm, I'm going to just give them a little bit of psychological uh, hmm. um, uh, credit here is i think what's degraded is immortality and maybe at the base of it is demanding it's somehow because physical things cease to produce life it it appears and at at base i think it might be a fear of death and a fear of of uh or a longing for immortality somehow um that but, people but, are afraid to relinquish but i yeah but that's that there's an illusion at the basis of that worry itself which is that we are something that could be immortal in a way <laughs> it's that the illusion of a self that could uh, the, what we're wanting to persist is a sort of illusion illusion of a of of a self that is unchanging and mm. uh, uh that has a kind of essential identity and that persists through our lives and so on. and we're wanting that to persist but that's just a way of conceptualizing ourselves and when you kind of realize that and you're just a bit of this massive you know this wondrous causal flux and you're just like a little sort of complex eddy in this great causal flux and when you and that eddy is going to dissolve but there's nothing sort of uh, there's there's no kind of substance there that's going to be destroyed is I, i don't know i i think that this perspective can help to dissolve those worries about the ego and the self you know and the persistence of the self when you realize that it isn't wasn't really there all along <laughs> yeah uh, for it's not you know you the thing that you want to preserve isn't was never really there mm-hmm. and what matters about you the things you care about the effects that you care about the things you want to do and achieve and the the influence you want to have in the world that can continue that can continue through your effects mm. through your influence on others this little eddy in the stream won't continue but maybe it can shape other eddies that will continue down the stream and again i think this is a much less individualistic egoistic perspective i like that i mean people tell me people who know a lot more about about buddhism than i do um tell me that this perspective is has a lot of resonance with with ideas in buddhism and from my uh, position of ignorance that that 
does seem rather plausible. The effect is really nice, obviously, as a way to uh, actually achieve immortality. It, it, this is the kind of immortality that that is mm. graspable and is yep. is achievable because if you are claiming that, um, you know, let's say. <laughs> Let, let's say we're, we're having this conversation now and you're having some effect on me. And that <laughs> is that is um, now a part of my my phenomenal experience and the illusion of having that phenomenal experience. E- even if it collapses, you're having an effect on me, meaning mm. like you're doing it. You're you're uh, <laughs> you are yeah. in me in the realest way possible. Yeah. And that is a way. And anybody who hears this podcast forever, like this is a <laughs> way for you to actually in not in any facetious kind of metaphorical way, but to literally continue to continue, continue to live on and because like, there was nothing ever th- uh, uh, there was nothing more than that ever right and it can have uh, different values i mean i can have a negative effect on others i can have a positive effect and that's a way of living on in something like a heaven and hell right <laughs> the dimensions of our effects on the rest of the world i suppose um people live on in infamy and people live on in in the, the hearts of other people and so yeah. So I, I don't know if I got to the the particular um, predictions or mm-hmm. areas that you think might be revealed if right. this way of yes. you I mean, that, yeah. Theor- yeah, I'm curious where, where you go with it, because theory of mind, maybe, as I mentioned in season one, Eric Coel and, and integrated information theory is something that mm-hmm. that you think dovetails with this or you're excited about that kind of people who are, are just trying to you know do the math and 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 ig- ignore the the metaphysical questions that that keep nagging um yeah wh- where do you think this might go what kind of what kind of dna are we going to discover if this way of thinking is the first step of sort of a darwinian hmm. step in the right direction about this very vexing problem which which take for granted something like darwin's theory of evolution was a rather vexing problem for millennia until a really good explanation shed light just like a good detective cracking a case and got us closer to um something that it it just is I don't think it poses new questions that weren't there all along because everyone agrees that the the effects are real. Everyone agrees that sensory experience has all sorts of effects on us and everyone needs to explain that, um, whether you're a realist or not. Uh, David Chalmers has recently defined what he calls the meta problem of consciousness. It's essentially what I call the illusion problem. It's explaining all our beliefs about consciousness. All the stuff our beliefs, our reactions, our intuitions about consciousness, including the intuitions that it's not physical and can't be explained and so on. Zombies would have all of these same reactions, these same beliefs, these same intuitions, and presumably Mm -hmm. they're going to be explained by psychological mechanisms, the sort of, you know, the sort of processes that are, that um, cognitive scientists, uh, you know, we're talking about representations and information processing and all kinds of stuff like that, uh, whatever. Or we might be going for something more like um, predictive processing, which is a very, um, uh, flourishing uh, approach at the moment, or whatever it might be. And, of course, we might need to, to bring in neuroscientific perspectives and all of this stuff. But the, all the tools that, that cognitive scientists have available to them, that's what we're going to use to explain these things. And I think even realists accept that. They kind of... they. They tend to accept that if that if these things are real, then they're somehow they're related to these processes. Maybe they kind of they're correlated with them in some way, or perhaps they realise them at a at a at a at a at a, at a fundamental level in the way that panpsychists think or something like this. But the actual fun- the, the processes of explaining the effect they're going to be uh, done in that's going to be done in in, in standard cognitive science terms. Mm-hmm. So all that needs explaining on this view. Uh, are those effects and everyone agrees that they need explaining so it's more the program is more of a negative one of not trying Mm. to explain anything else right right, it's saying focus on explaining those and you know concentrate on explaining those don't try to sort of explain this this fantasy thing this chimera Mm -hmm. this this you know concentrate on explaining how the trick was done yeah, does the and if we if we can focus on that and get good explanations that will ultimately ground right. themselves in some physical right. uh, input, as you're saying, you know, there's the input, there's the effect, and now we've yep. explained the thing and stop trying to put something in the middle. Um, right. 
is that will they, do you expect that, that will shed light on something yeah. like i don't want to get too moral with it but will that shed light on you know uh, animal consciousness and whether veganism or something is are are, are you know are, is there great harm being caused with sentient creatures and all these kinds of things or will this answer questions about ai it, or or we just don't know yet is great that question. is that where we're at yeah. i mean th those are very important questions and this certainly recasts those questions. Mm -hmm. It's going to force us to reframe those questions because at the present, the way we seem to be, uh, the way we seem to think about these things is, you know, what are the, what are, what, do these creatures have qualia? And what are their qualia like? Do they have a Cartesian theater? Are the, are the phenomenal lights on in their heads? Mm. Now that is, uh, it's a hard question. It's probably an impossible question. Yeah. Suppose we create an artificial intelligence that, you know, is a you know a perfect zombie as far as we can tell. It behaves exactly like us. There's all that. Maybe it's even more refined than us. It can make sense of discriminations that we can't. And you know, it can taste wine and you know tell you not just the vineyard and so on, but the day on which it was produced and so on, and, and who who you know pressed the grapes or whatever. It's got these wonderful fine discriminations where we can still say yes, we've done all that, but. Is it actually tasting it? Does it actually feel like anything? Are like now that question? When, no matter how much progress we make in artificial intelligence or in understanding, you know, in in, in comparative psychology and understanding the minds of other creatures, we're never going to answer that question. Right. Um, now you can just kind of live with that and sort of say, well, let's sort of try and have some general theoretical framework based on kind of just armchair theorizing about which creatures have this. Just you know how. Uh, you know, how are these things really distributed in reality? We can't ever test it, but let's just sort of use some general... And so you have people who say, well, atoms have these things, and other people say only humans have them, and some people say, you know, maybe that you need to have, you know, wet, squishy biological stuff to generate them, and others say no. You know, uh, silicon would do, silicon base. Uh, you can argue about this till the cows come home, but you won't solve it because you can never actually get inside another creature's mind. And find that was a good out. analogy, you've given my vegan question. Anyway, go on. I like the so, cows coming till back. The, till, till, <laughs> oh, they're coming back to be, to be milk, not that that is. Yeah, exactly. Um, they're coming no. back with grapes about consciousness. <laughs> um, so I think that way of thinking about it is a, uh, a dead end. I mean, in the yeah. end, we're going to make these decisions based on, I guess, you know, what's... You know, probably at a more emotive level. We're not going to, they're certainly not going to be informed by a theory of qualia in that sense, I think, because there's going to be no consensus about it. Mm -hmm. Now, if we stop thinking of it in that way, we get a quite different perspective. What we get is, well, these creatures have a lot of sensitivities and they have a lot of reactive dispositions to, those, uh, to, uh, to the things that they're sensitive to. You know, these things they pick up a lot of information from the world, about the world and they react to the world in uh, very complex ways. Um, yeah, which of these patterns matter? I mean, a, a thermostat does that, but mm -hmm. we don't think that a thermostat matters very much, which is fair enough. Uh, we do this in a very, 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 very sophisticated way. And we're also, we also think about our own sensitivities and reactions. We also have this kind of higher level where we conceptualize it and report it and say that we have consciousness as well as being aware of the world, we're also aware of our awareness and we, we talk about it. And we think we matter. Now, then there's this kind of continuum between us, I suppose, and, and thermostats and, you know, where does mattering come in? Well, there isn't on this view going to be a point where the lights come on and suddenly, you know, uh, moral significance kicks in. Right. You know, you can't say, you know, do fish have it or not have it? It's just it's a ridiculous question. The question is, we, we need to first of all have a very good uh, conception of the psychology of these creatures, of what effects things do have on them, and then we need to ask mm -hmm. ourselves, you know, what of this matters to us? I mean, there, there isn't a there isn't a hard line between creatures who who feel and creatures who don't. And similarly, with with artificial creatures, there won't be. A, we'll just get more and more sophisticated um, patterns of sensitivity and reaction. And at some point, we have to say this is this is this matters to us. Yeah, maybe I've been waiting too long or expecting too much out of consciousness studies to answer moral questions and, and exactly. you're probably right you're probably right it, it, it won't we're still going to be left with those it's not, um, it's not going to solve them i mean yeah so we'll be left with like well the effects of this kind of creature 
and this kind of input pattern it has the effects that lead it to form familiar bonds if it's like a, a, a yeah, yeah. pack animal or a, a monkey or something and then, we're, and then we'll have a separate philosophical question of like well i value those things so i won't eat that one but the, well, well, look, but the oysters are good you know well look we've got we've got i mean i guess there's an evolutionary basis to our to our to our to our emotional reactions to things and to our ethical reactions and of course you know we're we're built to care about things like ourselves but i think there's i don't think we have to i mean there's certain sorts of complexity and certain sorts of design that we might value for itself we might value a, a, a complex mechanism just because it's a beautiful piece of construction that somebody put a lot of effort into designing, it just as we are things that evolution to put a lot of effort into designing, and we may think that complexity is valuable for itself. We may think certain kinds of reactions, like pain reactions, are valuable in themselves because you know we we don't <laughs> we, we, they're things that we evaluate negatively and we might care about other creatures evaluating them negative, uh, uh, having things that we would evaluate negatively if we were having them. We just need mm. to think about this, but we need to think about it in a sort of clear-eyed view of what we're actually talking about, rather than uh, supposing that there's some uh, answer that might be revealed to us uh, by consciousness science, I think. I don't think that's quite going to work. Mm. I think I understand why there's a very strong argument from the illusionist perspective of free will being a totally coherent concept as long as you stop asking incoherent questions about free will of course we have free will from the perspective of i the the, the i i have the illusion and the effect of having a free will so it's just as real as the illusion of having something like um uh that that thing in the sandwich of the pain um it, and i think that's that's Plenty, <laughs> if that makes yeah. sense. I, I, okay, well, let's let's. I mean, this isn't something that I've, um, I've I've written a lot about, but I take it that the analogy here would be with someone who says, "Look, uh, okay, so you're an illusionist. So you're saying that consciousness doesn't exist. Wow, that has terrible consequences. We're all kind of blind and deaf, and we don't we don't feel anything, and you know, we don't have any inner life at all. And you know, you're just saying that we are kind of." Like zombies now, not in the sort of uh, uh, philosophical sense, but in the sort of Hollywood movie sense, we're just like this, just like robots with no feeling. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that consciousness isn't what you think it is, but we still can talk about being conscious in the way that I have been talking about it. And I take it there's an analogy there with free will. Some people say, okay, so look, it looks like science is telling us we don't have free will in this magical sense, and that has. Um, profound consequences we're just being pulled around by the universe the universe is we've got no control of ourselves we're just determined to behave and we're just we, we don't realize it but we're just like remote control robots controlled by the laws of nature and oh my god we're not you know that magical free kind of free will doesn't exist sure but you know we've got plenty of control we are mm -hmm. autonomous the sources of control lie within us they're, they're not they don't violate the laws of nature obviously in fact they depend on them but that the control processes that are incorporated within us because those bits of the world that are crucial in doing the causing are parts of us because mm -hmm. we are just bits of the physical world it's not like we're being controlled by the physical world we are the physical world you we only get this world, right? we only we are a chunk of the physical world and you know um, and so you only get the worry if there's kind of at the back of your mind there's some sort of implicit idea of yourself as something that isn't part of the physical world and is now being suddenly controlled by it apparently the neuroscientists are telling us or then you get this early you're, you're forced to watch it unfold in front of yeah, your eyes yeah, and yeah. you're even helpless yeah well i mean it could be hard determinist in the sense that you don't think there's anything that isn't um explicable in terms of the you know the natural processes um mm -hmm. physical processes that doesn't mean that you don't have any sort of control of yourself because you are yeah. the controlling processes the physical controlling processes are part of you yeah, I, I think where that departure is to put like a fine point on it is a, a kind of free will exists in this universe. And clearly it does. Clearly we have degrees of freedom and degrees of control over certain kinds of uh, inputs that come into us that we are able to to navigate through. Yeah, we have we have autonomy. The control processes are part of us. They're, they're, you know, OK, they're responding to stuff that isn't part of us, but the significant control processes are parts of us because we are parts of the physical world it's not you know it's it, the, the deterministic universe isn't something to sort of you know be afraid of because right. the significant bits of it here are 
parts of us. What do you think? What, what do you think all that stuff, all those neurons in your brain are? You know, um, they're not there for fun. You know, they're they're doing something, and yeah. they're, they're 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 responding to all these these these, these, these weird you know, stuff out there. All this all this uh, stuff that's impinging on us and trying to make sense of it and respond to it in a sensible way. I, there's the control. Yeah. I mean, do you find your, your, I'm curious with illusionism and if you find your kind of stance um, escapes the maybe tight inside baseball conversations about consciousness, which, which I love. And clearly in this part of the conversation, I'm now like wondering how they seep out into the world of morality or politics Mm -hmm. or, or do you find that they, that they permeate outside or do you, do you wish some of these things or, or imagining a world where, where they were more widely adopted, how that would radically change the way that we organize in society or is, I'm just curious about how, if you run into people who's, who maybe who aren't inside the conversation, who wonder why any of this really matters or how it will affect them in a day to day kind of life, um, or or will it, or is or is this still just far too un- unpredictable? I'm just curious to put that on your plate of like, what's the use of all of this stuff? I clearly love it from sort of a philosophical curiosity standpoint, and I think it it obviously, as we just were hinting about about maybe morality or religious structures of morality, um, it could it could topple some very bad ideas. But where do you do you see it ever? I don't know. It's a good causing a, a yeah a shift outside of the of the funny little infights that happen between <laughs> Chalmers and Dennett and Sam Harris and these people. That's that's a good question, and it's it's a salutary question, I think, for philosophers um, working in this area because philosophers generally, it's very easy to to inhabit this 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 this, this world of uh, competing theoretical positions, yeah. and it's like a chess game, and the rules are quite well defined, and the moves are fairly well defined, and the um, uh, the game playing the game is all about trying to find some new move, um, and it's it's easy to forget that it is sort of you know that it isn't it shouldn't be just a game. It should be about right. conceptualizing ourselves and our world in a better way, and if we succeed in that, then that should have profound effects. I mean, what we're talking about here is understanding what kind of beings we are and how we're related to the rest of the natural world. And, uh, you know, is there something metaphysically special about us, something that sets us apart from non-conscious creatures and inanimate things and so on? Or is consciousness somehow fu- uh, uh, fundamental to the... Uh, these, 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 now, exactly how the the different answers would play out in the way that we actually live our lives. Now, that's interesting. But it, it, it ought to, I think. We do expect it to. Um, I th- and I, th- I mean, we mentioned earlier thinking about immortality. And there are certain conceptions of what we are on which immortality seems much more. We, we talk about what happens after death. Well, <laughs> well, if you think we're just parts of the physical universe, just parts of the physical, then we know perfectly well in, in all too much detail what happens after death it's um, you know, uh, and you know you can find out everything you want to know about it um it's not very uh, you know, uh, comforting but you can find mm-hmm. it out now the question what happens after death is the question about is a different question as most people ask it's about what happens to, to this private mental world not what happens in the physical world what happens in this which is understood to be something separate from you know where do i do i wake up afterwards do i this private mental being wake up somewhere afterwards now, if you accept us, if you accept the physicalist point of view, you're, you're not even going to ask that question because this, it's like asking, you know, about questions about the psychokinesis that the magician does. There's nothing to ask about; it doesn't exist. So yes, and that might profoundly affect how people behave. I, people sometimes, you know, the people um, are motivated to. Um, to do heroic and dreadful things uh, by the prospect of uh, mm. of uh, reward after death. So, yes, that that could have profound changes. Um, now, how they play out? How do they play out beneficially? Or are some illusions actually bene- You know, are, are some illusions benign? Uh, could it? You know, I guess what we're in danger of losing is perhaps a sense of our Mm. a sense of our being special in one sort of way 
I don't think we necessarily need to lose a sense of our being special because we are pretty special. I think we're, we're mm -hmm. very special parts of the physical world, but we're not special in another way. And so maybe it means reconceptualizing ourselves. And I, it's interesting that we're, you know, we're doing this at a point where it's not going to be too long before we start creating artificial beings that have a specialness mm -hmm. you know, comparable to our own, uh, a, a functional specialness comparable to our that can react in ways that are similar to the way we react. I suspect that those sorts of developments are, are going to force this kind of reconceptualization on ourselves anyway, even if we weren't coming mm. at it independently. How this is all going to work out, I don't know. I mean, you, we may have people, <laughs> we may, and it's, mm, it's perhaps not a very um, comforting prospect, but we may have people retreating to a what kind of primitive conception of human specialness in the face of that artificial specialness. We may have you know, yeah. kind of populist movements saying, no, we are not at all like them. We're nothing like them. We do have this, 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 this metaphysically special inner world, and that sets us apart. And you know, we we, des we we deserve rights and protections and so on that they don't deserve. And that could lead to all manner of uh, of conflicts. Hmm. And uh, so, the answer to your question is, I, I don't know how it will play out, but I do think, I do think it is it is relevant to much wider issues. And I I really should. I, I really do want to think a lot more about this, though these things are so hard to um, yeah. to extrapolate. I think. Well, the, yeah, and maybe it's an maybe I'm asking a moral question, which which um, is not fair. <laughs> I'm not sure because I'm imagining some sort of if we fully adopt the the illusionist view and and it it plugs us into the physical universe in this very mm -hmm. to me at least very like beautiful and profound mm. way that 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 a very Carl Sagan kind of we are just stardust <laughs> yes, kind of way yes. right you know it's yes, a, a, yes. but 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 literally my favorite Carl Sagan quote I've, I've quoted this many times in season one but is the we are a way for the universe to know itself yes, um, yes. And, and it's beautiful but this yes. your stance is that rather detailed embodied and, and it's also putting in a, a seemingly special quality of the of the stuff that we are that has this explanatory power to notice patterns even in the illusion in 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 the world and notice the patterns in our own illusions and everything notice patterns and make predictions and make mm -hmm, make mm -hmm. sense sense of the world if that is something that we hook or hinge a kind of specialness that you're talking about to mm -hmm. um it's beautiful, but it also seems vulnerable. As you're talking about AI, I'm, you could even mm -hmm. do it in another way of imagining some sort of alien race coming down that clearly mm -hmm. does yeah. this way yeah. better than we do. <laughs> They're like, yes. oh, we, we yes. know we know all those patterns and yes. that's yes. child's play for us and check out all these other patterns that we have that are like <laughs> way cooler than yours that we already discovered and, and they can do things that appear to be telekinesis mm -hmm. to us, you know, mm -hmm. like their, their babies can do it. Are we then forced to just admit like, oh, they, they're more special than us on some, <laughs> some moral way? And if, and if we end up in some sort of tragic trolley problem resource game, they ought to extinguish us. I think this is a horror show for a lot of thinkers and probably a lot of science fiction in the next 150 <laughs> years or less is going to be on. I mean, it's not that this is a new fear, but mm -hmm. very much I think this fear is on, on the minds of, of people in, plugged into this conversation it's like lurking in the shadows somewhere that you're honing in on some sort of special quality or special ability and and it's it's by no means are we guaranteed to be on the top of the rung of that ladder <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm, absolutely yeah. I, I, certainly though, i think one if these sort of scenarios do start to play out i think one thing that we that we need is self-understanding we need to at least you know we need to correctly understand what what we are we mustn't maybe we still entertain some of these illusions on a day-to-day -day level but we mustn't rely on them because mm -hmm. they're going to let us down uh in that sort of scenario the best we can do i suppose is understand ourselves understand what we are, understand our abilities understand how we can maximize them and <laughs> let's see let's see what happens Relying on out on on outdated delusions is not going to help us at all. Um, yeah. So clear, we, best we can do is enter enter this this really quite challenging, frightening, and also exciting future clear eyed. Did 
Do, do you think we're seeing the very early throes of that? I mean, I'm, I'm mm. imagining a future historian a thousand years from now noticing this moment mm. of, I don't know how plugged in you are to the awful culture wars and everything else going on, especially <laughs> in America at the moment. It's nothing I really want to get into in a detailed mm -hmm. level here, but but I wonder if some future historian is going to very clearly, and as you said, sort of clear-eyed see this moment as the beginning stages as what you, you pointed to there of, of a maybe a, a clinging to or a retreat to some former brand of specialness where it's very, it's becoming very clear that even the early baby steps of automation are, can do things better than we can do ourselves mm -hmm. on all sorts of fronts. And that, that alien that I'm saying that comes down, we're clearly just inventing that out of our own machines. Yeah. Um, and are, are, are we at the early stages of, of, um, yeah, of a, of a fear of not being honest about who we are or what we are, not knowing how, how to, I don't know, uh, place ourselves in a universe where we haven't, um, uh, replaced ourselves. And our and our function in it, and our specialness in it, even. I mean, we've we've come a long way very very quickly. I mean, uh, I uh, I'm not a fan of sort of crude versions of evolutionary psychology, though I do think we need we need an evolutionary perspective on the human mind. I don't think we're we're really cognitively adapted to the sort of world we're creating. Though at the same time, this our our cognition is itself heavily dependent on artifacts we've created. We have created our own minds. And what we've done is we've taken minds that were adapted to quite different environments and we've supplemented them with all kinds of, 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 uh, of uh, artifacts, the tools and tricks and things, language most obviously, but all, you know, we've developed mathematics and we've developed um, uh, technologies that allow us to offload information and uh, to pass on information and to use information in, in, in new ways and to do remarkably um, uh, clever things that our unaided brains could never do. And the, our minds are products of all of this. But this is accelerating at a, at a very rapid pace now with, um, uh, I mean, I'm old enough to, to remember a time, you know, not just before the internet, but before personal computers. Mm -hmm. Uh, these things are becoming increasingly integrated into our uh, you know, into our uh, experience of the world and our, our thinking about the world. I mean, a lot of people are. I mean, a lot of people kind of do politics through Twitter, which is a <laughs> strange way to do it. Um, you know, they're they kind of their 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 immediate object of their political activity is kind of icons on Twitter rather than uh, people, um, and. There's a, it's, we're continue. we've been continually enhancing our minds for a long time, but with kind of fragile instruments of which we, increasingly we understand less and less. I mean, our smartphones are very important parts of our, of our cognition nowadays, but most people understand them very poorly, and this is going to continue to, and, uh, we're going to continue sort of offloading activity or incorporating uh, uh, artifacts into our cognitive activity that we don't understand and whose effects we can't predict. We are ceasing to be the creatures we once were, the sort of the, 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 the hunter-gatherers who um, and the, the, the social creatures who have relatively stable sorts of lives and kind of knew how to navigate those environments. And we're becoming a very different kind of creature uh, without really understanding it very well and without being perhaps very well prepared for the kind of, for the kind of lives we're going to lead. Uh, now, how we handle that, I don't know. I think there's going to be a big element of luck um, in it. We don't know how it's going to play out. We could go very, very wrong. Uh, very, um, it, there's, I mean, Dan Dennett has mentioned the dangers of our of our trusting so much to to expert technology that you know we we rely on it very heavily without recognizing its limitations without recognizing how, despite its smartness, how stupid it is. Um, right. We offload a lot of activity onto uh, app, expert apps, and we cease to gather the sort of expertise that we need to make intelligent decisions for ourselves. Maybe we become so good at doing Twitter politics that we can't do real politics. Um, <laughs> uh, it's exciting and kind of frightening, and uh, I guess we've just got to kind of try and surf these 
these big waves that are coming in. Uh, yeah, hope we can hope we can we can come through it. Um, maybe <laughs> maybe this is the maybe that what we're experiencing now is something is this stage this you know as we're becoming as it were post human where you know we're entering what people talk talk about as the great filter you know the the thing that <laughs> that that that, that uh, puts an end to advanced technological civilizations. I don't know. Um, yeah, I, I, well, I don't know either. <laughs> it's it is interesting. It's fun to, to say that. The, yeah, and it, it is it is a bit frightening to to. I, I guess it's why you know I, I do this show because I think philosophy is so so needed. This this episode, I, I'm loving this conversation, obviously, but um, because the kinds of eternally <laughs> vexing problems that we've faced for so long, which felt fun. Maybe this is why I'm asking you. It felt like the kind of stuff that ivory tower academics could talk about. But meanwhile, we're busy plowing the fields and just like keeping <laughs> things going and keeping f food on our tables. Um, you've, you've all Harari recently, you know, called the, the, the trolley problem when it comes to self-driving <laughs> cars, you know, moral philosophy on a deadline, <laughs> which is philosophy. Philosophers like yourself are not used to working on deadlines <laughs> like this. It's like sit in a room, take as long as you want, write papers. But but I'm I'm sort of pressing you here being like, like, how, we need you. We need you now because these these problems are related to the deepest foundational problems of how we derive meaning from the world. You, you talked about what matter matters. If, if we are just matter, which clearly, the, and I'm, I'm fully on board, we are just matter. But that word just is always the really hard one there because it tends to carry a negative dismissive yep. quality. Yep. And you're saying no, phrase it the other way of like, no, yes. we're just matter. How magical is that? So what, but what matter matters because we are <laughs> making matter that can do magic tricks as we're saying from <laughs> yeah. the start of this yeah. Yeah. that are that are uh at least you know granting the illusion for us mm -hmm. of something mm -hmm. rather profound and um yeah. So I, 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 we need we need the philosophers and we need philosophers of mind in particular to <laughs> to really coalesce and I think be a and, and you know you're not one of them but a lot of them are trapped in their own academia and we need more of them i think to engage in conversations with the public about yes. these things i'll give you i'll yes. give you a small anecdote because this um uh, I, I was invited to a um uh a, do a screening um in iceland actually and my hosts were wonderful and uh, you know maybe a little woo woo ish and, and she asked me if i wanted to come to this thing and it was like a buddhist i don't remember his name though a buddhist monk although he was he was an american he spent some time in tibet giving this talk or whatever at some sort of little yoga center and you know i went in it's like cool i'm totally open let's talk and, and he lays out his his little trinkets and stuff and he's giving this conversation and, and there's probably about 30 of us in there. We're all sitting on our mats and I'm, we're all <laughs> listening. And he, uh, you know, was talking. I, the topic was like life and death and resurrection or something. And he's he's speaking in very Buddhist language. And in my mind, as someone who, who spends a lot of time thinking and, and studying on theory of consciousness, I'm able to translate just about everything he's saying into scientifically coherent concepts. And I'm kind of on, on board with it. There's like religious kind of overtones to the way he's saying it, but I can sort of flip it in my mind about, oh, he's what he really means there is this notion of qualia, whatever. Mm -hmm. And then some someone in the uh, who was sitting next, and everyone's sort of listening and taking notes, and it was all sort of nice and lovely. And this woman sitting next to me raises her hand at this point, and he, you know, he nods at her, and she says, um, "Can you tell me about reincarnation? Mm -hmm. is, rein is reincarnation real?" And he begins to answer with some sort of, I don't even know how he started, some sort of flowery thing that was wishy-washy. And she actually interrupted him and said like, no, 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 I mean like reincarnation. <laughs> and it was clear to me, and I think everybody in there, that like she's talking about her grandmother who just died and mm -hmm. asking the very simple question of like, am I going to see her again? Mm -hmm. Where is she? I miss her. You know, like this very mm -hmm. emotional thing. And he starts to answer, and I'm getting very excited now uh, as someone who likes this stuff and I'm listening. And he starts to give this answer about imagining sort of like two two hooks he's talking about the mind body problem really and he's like mm -hmm. so you have your mind here and your body here and they're sort of hooked together and he says something very nice of something like you know what reincarnation is real every single moment is a reincarnation of the previous moment mm -hmm. and on some sort of scientific level like that's a lovely thought and also probably grounded in something cool of like you I, i'm a different collection of atoms mm -hmm. than the one who started this conversation with you and the next instant 
in the universe will be a reincarnation of this one in some way. And if you if you imagine pausing the entire universe and the momentum of every single mm-hmm. physical quark in it or whatever, uh, the next one, and, and somehow my illusion of a self in it exists mm-hmm. in that moment. And then the next one gets created, which is just called the next moment in time. And my illusion of self also exists in that one. Well, yes, in some kind of interestingly cool poetic way, you could say reincarnation exists, right? Mm -hmm. But of course she's asking about real reincarnation. (laughs) And so he's getting to the moment of death. And so he's like, he's doing this thing with his fingers where they're linked with the mind and the body. And every moment is a reincarnation of the previous. And he's getting to this moment of a body dying. And he, st- and he says, like, okay, it's reincarnated and they're linked. It's reincarnated and they're linked. It's reincarnated and they're linked. And then there is a moment of death. And the next moment, they are unlinked. And at this moment, I was very excited. of like, he has to, I-, I want her badly to tell her something true here. And from that exact moment, from that moment where they were unlinked, he went off into some, like, you know, the soul is reincarnated and goes into all these things. And he was talking about all of these you know, children who have these previous life experiences and it's been right. studied and, and it was like total. And I was so like my heart sunk mm-hmm. and I was dismayed. And I was looking at this woman who was eagerly writing down all of the notes and eating up every word. Mm-hmm. And I was just kind of horrified of like, these people are here totally looking for a wonderful, a real conversation. And they're asking great questions yeah. and no offense to this guy, but what, he mm-hmm. just doesn't know or whatever, but what he's giving them is is uh bullshit and and um when as you and i are both talking about a lot in this conversation when the real conversation is so ripe with magic Mm -hmm. and wonder and profundity that i was like i want i didn't interrupt him but i wanted to get up there and be like no 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 let me tell you what i what we know about that and how wonderful and beautiful it is and how as we talked about earlier the kind of immortality that is real in a way of your grandmother who's still here in some ways, yeah. but it would totally yeah. failed. Yeah. And so the, so people are out there desperately asking good questions. We're, we're entering a phase of human evolution and civilizational evolution where we're, we're becoming more comfortable and machines are operating a little more. We have a little more time to ask these things, but what's out there is so um, bad. <laughs> that was my plea for you to go kick that monk out and have I, it come. <laughs> I, no, I, I couldn't agree more. I mean, I don't want, to be too sort of negative about the professional philosophy, people around the people working in the field are under a lot of uh, pressure from their institutions to keep publishing. And the easiest way to keep publishing is really just to make another move in the standard game. It's mm. you know sort of you know you're playing this chess game, just make another move, you know, publish it, go on. You know it's uh, and they need it to you know progress and get uh, in their careers and you know, keep their jobs and so on. So I'm, I've, I'm not down on that, but I uh, I do think there is so I, I think you're right. There's so much m- more we could be doing. We could be using our talents for. I mean, and I do think that a lot of actually that a lot of traditional philosophical problems. I'm not a uh, believer in this idea that it's all footnotes to Plato and so on. That it's just perennially revisiting the same problems. I don't. I think certain problems, like the problem of free will, just have to be just put to bed. Mm-hmm. Um, and actually, I think the same for the problem of consciousness. And kind of what I'd be most <laughs> delighted to be able to do with the problem of consciousness is to just hand it over to the to the scientists to get on with and to solve what needs solving. I, I don't think there is a matter. I mean, uh, Dan Dennis has this lovely thing that, you know, there's about the same many, the same number of cells in a bowl of y- yeast as there are in your brain. And the cells aren't themselves any different. They're just connected up a bit differently. And um, so anyway, so it's getting off track. I would like to, my aim for the philosophy of consciousness is to uh, end it. Um, <laughs> and get on with more interesting things. Um, how do you do that? <laughs> the problem is we don't have the institutional structures to enable that. Um, mm. uh, institutional philosophy at the moment isn't really encouraging. Yes, uh, universities want impact and outreach and so on, but this is assessed quite quite narrowly. We need to invent new ways. Now, some people are doing this, often outside or on the edge of academia. People like my, like my friend Nigel Warburton, who's create this wonderful podcast series, Philosophy Bites, which mm, you might yeah. know, which is bringing yeah. philosophy, uh, just short, concise explanations of what people are doing, mm-hmm. presented for a, a wide audience, That's great stuff. And he's devoted his life, really, to in taking what philosophers are doing and presenting it to the public. And I think that's important, because if we're not, if we're not, if we're not 
doing something that people can use. And it's not like philosophy is going to uh, feed in, I guess, to sort of building new rockets or something. You know, it's going to affect people through affecting how they live and how they they, they think about themselves. As when it, if it does get to the stage where it has practical effects and you know technology and so on, then it it, it, it splits off into a separate discipline. Mm -hmm. uh, so how do we do this? I mean, the kind of stuff you're doing, I, I guess, is is is, is para academic institutions, something like podcasts, get but. How do we fund people? How do we fund this kind of research? How do we actually get people employed to do this? Um, it's the, the moment it's really asking people whose livelihoods depend on academic positions and in institutions to, to go out and devote their time to being kind of, I suppose, um, not exactly preachers, but um, uh, we're still too tied to the institutional model and in that what they're doing is simply presenting the work that is being done in institutions. And often that work is tremendously important. I don't want to cry, but. Well, well, well let, let me offer something that I think is even uh, is less, uh, you know, asking someone like yourself to like, you know, like write a children's book, which would be great. <laughs> but oh. it's like, yeah, like, but like you do your, your stuff is I think what's needed, I'm not the first to suggest this, but much more integration within the different departments of academia itself, that the philosophy department and the science department or the IT department are a bit too um, you know, isolated and siloed at the moment. I think not to, to pick on him too much. Someone like Mark Zuckerberg is one of the most influential and powerful political people in the world. Uh, I, you know, I don't know the kind of education that he got, but I doubt he really has a, was given a firm grasp of, of, yeah. of moral philosophy or something like that. And I, I don't know if we just need more integration of these kinds of conversations. Uh, yeah, you know, I agree with that. I think, I think yes, philosophy department's a good place to train philosophers, but perhaps not such a good place to employ them. Um, maybe as you say, <laughs> That's a great idea. Yeah. Every department maybe should have its, you know, its resident philosopher who uh, would. Yeah. Uh, Presumably, be a, a figure of, uh, um, of uh, would at least provide amusement for the rest of the department. Um, <laughs> and, but maybe every maybe every community should have its resident um, uh, GP, not a general practitioner, a doctor, but a, a, a general philosopher who uh, yeah. would have office hours and people could, could just go and talk to about their um, uh, about their lives. I mean, not in a therapeutic way so much as in a as, as in a, a questioning way. Uh, pe people often, you know, just they have, they have, people have philosophical questions all the time, and they they really enjoy talking about them. And uh, yeah, why why don't we why don't we have like um, I mean, okay, so and this is I think I think Coleridge had this idea, didn't he, of a sort of secular clergy, who mm -hmm. would uh, so every 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 parish would have its um, sort of resident intellectual. Maybe um, maybe this is a this is a uh, <laughs> vanity idea for, for for philosophers but yeah why why not have have why not? Uh, we're why just not? brainstorming here i won't hold you any, <laughs> to any of it don't worry uh i mean i get i get lots and lots of emails from people who want who want to discuss consciousness with me and yeah i don't always have the time to reply and which i'm i'm I regret because they're passionate about it. They're interested about it. Sometimes it, it's not always easy to reply. Sometimes because they, it's really hard to know what to say. They their ideas are so kind of strange and it's difficult right, right. to know what to say without being impolite. In other cases, because they are genuinely interesting ideas, and it would take some time to discuss them properly, and I would have to spend two or three hours probably thinking about it and replying, and I just don't have that time. But people are desperate for this, and you know, if I were paid to yeah. do it, I would be, I'd be very happy to, to, to spend my time doing it. And I think if there were people who were, uh, if there were trained philosophers who were available to, 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 to be consulted, consulting yeah. philosophers, that's what I want to be the Sherlock Holmes of, of uh, the, the consulting philosopher. <laughs> yeah. Well, that, that woman in Iceland would have, she was desperate for it. And I was dismayed by the level of answer that she, she got. Well, this, this is so there. tricky because people, are, yeah, of course, people need, need, need comfort. And this is a world where uh, yeah. no matter how, how, we, uh, how we improve uh, society, it's, it's, it's loss and grief and uh, sadness are in, you know, in, uh, intrinsic to human life. And we need ways of dealing with them. And it's hard to say when someone offers something like that, that, that people do find comforting. It's hard to say that they, that they shouldn't. But I do think that relying on illusions is, is 
ultimately, uns- uh, well, they will let you down. You know, reality has a way of asserting itself, mm-hmm. and you can you can you can kind of hide from it for a while. But in the end, it's much safer and more comforting to rely on something solid. And I th- there are sources of comfort in 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 reality. I think. And yeah. articulating those and offering those, I think, is a much better service than offering cheap uh, stories that, for, for a while, maybe they, it's, you know, it's like a sort of, I don't know, a drug that you know, relieves it for a while, but then it leaves you with a low because, you know, as I say, reality asserts itself and the, 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 the illusion, you can't help in the unseeing behind the trick, I think. Maybe that's where we should end it because I think that was, you offered a lot of, I think, uh, beautiful descriptions of of reality and perhaps that comforting illusion of the soul is just a little stubborn even in the <laughs> consciousness studies and this is just a rebrand of it by de- by uh demanding that there that there is something spooky and mysterious sitting in between uh mm. reality and our the effect of reality on us um but it's a nice illusion, and I think mm-hmm. I think it, yeah, and and I think that's a nice way to 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 put it, um, or to to cast it. But mm-hmm. it is an illusion, just as the soul mm-hmm. was and is and always mm-hmm. will be. <laughs> but here we are in this beautiful, mysterious, complicated universe, and we are truly, truly a part of it. And I guess uh, consciousness as stubborn as it is or, 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 or as easy as it is to, that it seems to be an off ramp to not be in it, we should go ahead and realize that off ramp is just going straight off a cliff. <laughs> and uh, I, I, I think I'm, I'm full, I'm fully on board with the language of illusionism. I'll, I'll, I'll keep um, pondering it. But as I said, I, you know, it's my favorite, it's my favorite topic. It's the, the biggest question. Um, and I went into this study just even a few days ago with your work thinking that I was going to hate it and being very afraid of this conversation and now actually loving it. And by the time we talked, I think really grokking what the project is and, um, yeah, fully on board. Well, thank so you. Count thank me you. In. Until, yeah. uh, until the next interview with, with, with someone else, maybe. Yeah. 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 Next week I'm having a pan psychic and I'm fully back over there. No, no, I, I, I think this is wonderful. And then, um, as far as people finding your work, I don't know where you do most of, of your writing and your work. I know the, I, a lot of the, the study that I did to prepare for this was in that anthology you did, uh, on illusionism. I think you published your first, you, your section of it, but you put sort yeah. of a, a really wonderful, you edited a collection, I think just called illusions, right? Or illusionism. Uh, illusionism as a theory of consciousness. A the, as a theory of consciousness, which I think you could yeah. find. And then I don't know if you're active on any of the social media the, stuff or where you like to sort of be interacted with. The, the best place to, to, to find out about my work is my website, which is keithfrankish.com. Or one word. Keithfrankish.com. Uh, you can also find me on Twitter, being fairly active on Twitter. At, yeah. Again, at Keith Frankish, one word. Awesome. Take okay. care. Great talking to you. Right. Take care. Bye. So that was Keith Frankish. And if you have questions on this topic, I don't blame you. It can be rather complicated stuff. But perhaps one of the lessons I take from this conversation is that we often overcomplicate consciousness conversations by asking the wrong questions. For me, it was a really calming experience and has brought me closer to the mysterious universe we not only find ourselves in, but that we actually are. I also meant every word about my mission to export these conversations as widely as possible. I think often about that experience in Iceland and use it as motivation to expose more people to good language and conversations. I remember as a teenager feeling alone and frustrated, thinking I was the only one having these kinds of crazy thoughts in my head. I also then probably thought I was really cool and must be pretty special for having them if no one else was. Uh, But discovering that there were entire schools of thought and words like qualia, solipsism, illusionism, physicalism, realism, you know, thought experiments like philosophical zombies and Mars transporters, it was just like incredible. So I also discovered it too late in life. I think we're failing teenagers and college students pretty badly by siloing these ideas in philosophy departments and only sort of exposing philosophy majors to them. We have to keep figuring out ways to find each other and share our theories on how this magician is pulling off the greatest trick in the universe, which is 
the universe itself. So in episode seven coming up, I talk to the street artist named Swoon, although she does installation and gallery art now as well. Swoon, also her real name is Caledonia Curry, is an incredible artist if you look her up. I mean, just beautiful, beautiful stuff. You may have seen her stuff, especially if you're in New York. She um, was a popular street artist and sort of the Banksy craze in those days. And we get into the conversation around pretty much the, the topic of Uh, of not just her work, but also what art is, who art belongs to, and this question of if machines can make art. Um, And I think you'll really enjoy it. So that's in in a week when I release it. And uh, also there's a little secret that I will reveal in that episode. So (laughs) I've been keeping it secret from you all the way up through this episode. So I will see you pretty soon in a week. Let's do it in a week. See ya.